Throughout the history of Japan, our emperors have been the heart of our nation. It was they who kicked out the European imperialists, defeated the Russians at Port Arthur, and spread our empire to China and the Pacific. However, in recent years, our current emperor, Emperor Hirohito, has been sidetracked and the Prime Minister, together with the Toshiya faction in the army and navy, have been gaining more and more power. They, especially the navy, plan to expand our empire to the resource-rich south. But there is a resistance to these ideas. The Kodoha faction in the army seeks to fully restore the divine power of our emperor. And instead of expanding south, the northern approach is favored. And this faction have been planning a coup d'etat to fulfill their Showa restoration. It was launched the 26th of February by a group of young Imperial Japanese officers with them immediately surrounding the Prime Minister's residency. While he managed to flee, other elements of the coup managed to find him and kill him. Several other government officials and Toshiya loyalists were also purged and the military had soon taken control of all of Tokyo with the new government quickly being established and it immediately went to work with the Showa restoration. The emperor himself will be the one ruling our empire, not anyone else. The army was also quickly purged out of anyone favoring the southern approach, with our whole country turning towards preparing for war with our communist neighbors seemingly overnight. Because the sooner we strike, the better, especially as rumors are arriving that Stalin is growing increasingly paranoid. So, the national mobilization law was put in place by Hirohito and the war industries were nationalized to serve the empire to their fullest potential. However, all industries won't be nationalized because the Zaibatsus will also be handed over parts of the industrial sector. These conglomerates account for the majority of our industrial output at the cost of some political power. One of them is for example Mitsubishi who produce most of our aircrafts. With the war approaching, we held a central conference between all the branches of our government and the military where several things were decided. Before the full attack is launched against the Soviets, we will test them by starting small border skirmishes along our Korean front. We also massively increased funding to the army, scaling back from the navy, which has allowed us to start equip all our infantry units with 72 pieces of 75mm artillery. During the conference we also started preparing our Manchurian and Manchukuo allies for the war, mostly by constructing better infrastructure. Since we still lack some artillery we had the time to further prepare and we did this by sending some of our generals all the way to Finland to learn from their winter training, in return for a guarantee. Some less important things were also undertaken, mainly further industrialization. With our production and imports of artillery finally having catched up, we are ready for war, and just as planned it started with a border conflict in Korea. While we first thought we would win it, the Soviets reinforced the area with more troops. However, this had doomed their defense on their flank, so instead of letting our Korean forces lose the battle, we escalated it to a full-on war by crossing the border from Manchuria. Just as planned, this part was fully open, allowing us to reach the Sea of Japan and encircle Vladivostok in five days. The same day, the city fell to our forces, completely encircling six Soviet divisions. And only six days later, they were all either captured or killed. But now begins the hard part, going along the Trans-Siberian Railway through the horribly supplied Siberia. Fortunately, we have two secret plans to tackle the terrain. The first is already in production, transport planes. The second is simply logistics companies that our R&D programs are currently researching. However, we can't wait for these to be finished, instead we continued in the areas we actually have supply in. One of these areas was bordering the Soviet supply hub in Birubitsan and with only two divisions protecting it, we could capture it rather quickly. This not only gave us a supply hub, but also cut off the Soviet Soviet one in Khabarovsk. So before they built a new railway to it, we tried to capture it from Vladivostok. At first the offensive was extremely successful as we even encircled four divisions, however the further north we went the less supply could arrive from Vladivostok, so after reaching the border to Khabarovsk state we had to stop. But instead of completely stopping we started another attack from the west instead and with the Soviet forces in the region having suffered a lot from their own supply issues. We could cross the Amur once again with our forces soon arriving to Khabarovsk and capturing its supply hub. We used it to stage our biggest offensive yet with the goal to reach the Sea of Okhotsk. Despite having troubles in the end, the sea was still reached, encircling a huge amount of Soviet forces in the process. 
They would all slowly get worn down by our forces, punching them tighter and tighter until they were either forced to surrender or die not wanting to. However, this wasn't the best news that arrived. It actually arrived all the way from Europe. Because after our war started with the Soviets, our relations with Poland have only improved. Especially as they crowned Friedrich Christian as king, who seeks to restore the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And as they saw our victories in the East, they decided to formalize our alliance and create the Tokyo-Warsaw Pact, joining the war some days later. And despite the great distance between us, we sent 16 of our most trained infantry divisions to them, which will take 90 days for them to arrive, but with the European front a lot more important it is necessary. While we waited for the arrival, Poland already started advancing into the USSR and we soon got help from Lithuania and Latvia. However, the Soviets were surprisingly quick to react and could already push the Polish forces back. Fortunately, our units arrived just in time to turn the tide once again and this time the Soviets won't be able to return. After a little more than a year of fighting, we not only reached Leningrad, but the Soviet army has also been reduced to less than one million men. However, our invasion, which seems to be incredibly successful, is doomed to fail. And it's all because of Hitler and his unjustifiable claims on Poland. We have received intelligence that he is planning to ask for Danzig, and if our Polish allies don't surrender it, we would be fighting an impossible to win two front war. Hitler has even gone so far as to sign a pact with the Soviets, his mortal enemy. So realizing Poland has already fallen, we have decided to abandon them. But not by simply shipping our troops back to Japan. No, the Soviets are so weak right now that we can copy the Czechoslovak legion and evacuate through the Trans-Siberian Railway. And at the same time we can restart our offensive in the east. While this might seem like we are abandoning our Polish allies completely, we have promised them that we will return. Not only by defeating the Soviets, but also destroying the Nazis. But before we can do that, we must evacuate. In order to keep the Soviets from cutting off our supply lines, we took multiple ways to the same goal, which was crossing the Urals. On the way, we captured Moscow and several other cities. But we soon realized that we wouldn't reach our desired destination before the fall of Poland. So we sent all our forces to Kazan and ordered them to resupply themselves. This was smart because as Poland fell to the German forces we were now fully supplied and ready to hold the city until our forces in the east arrive. And we will hold because even the Poles have joined us as they have created their government in exile in the city. And we have support from Russian dissidents whom we have managed to organize into a collaboration government. Now back home the long march to Kazan has already started as we just recently arrived to Ulaanbaatar and Irkutsk. But things are difficult, especially as the Chinese are constantly destroying stuff along our small border. However, our population and army is more than willing to fight for our nation, allowing Hirohito to declare a state of national defense, because we must defeat the Soviets before they manage to rebuild their forces. Using the supply hub in Irkutsk, we quite easily overwhelmed both Soviet Tanutuvan and Mongolian forces, allowing us to capture Kuzil, capitulating the Tanutuvans, Ulangom, forcing the Mongolians to surrender, and finally the next supply hub on the Trans-Siberian Railway. After that, we simply went from supply hub to supply hub, first Novosibirsk, Omsk, and then all together Tuimen, Shelibinsk, and Sverdlovsk, with our forces finally reaching the Ural Mountains. It went so quick in the end, both because a Russian collaboration government has recently grown a lot stronger and because our holdout in Kazan has been expanding. 
not only territorially cutting all railways to the east, but also in numbers as anyone angry at Stalin, which is a lot of persons, are joining our forces. And so we march the final few kilometers to reunite with a part of our army not seen in two years. We've now done it, the Soviets have been utterly humiliated once again and the road to Moscow stands wide open. However, the question isn't if we can, it is if we should. Because once the Soviets finally capitulate, the Axis won't hesitate to march into their lands, meet our armies and push us back all the way to Vladivostok. Because unlike the Red Army, the German forces are incredibly effective and successful. After thinking and planning for some time, we decided that the best course of action would be to capitulate the Soviets, but at a slower pace. Because while we slowly defeat them, we will mobilize as many troops as we can and import guns from other nations to allow us to train even more of them. Then, once the Soviets are defeated, we won't go west to meet the German advances. Instead, we will stay in the harder to supply east until we have enough forces to fight the Germans in an equal battlefield. So we slowly advanced, making sure to encircle any Soviet forces that we met. And it wasn't many as all newly trained troops that arrived were rapidly dismantled. After the fall of the Gorky Defense Force, there was nothing standing in our way to Moscow, allowing us to return to the city without any issues, also putting the Soviets over 50% towards capitulation. But from here we won't continue that much westwards, as setting up a defensive line in Moscow moving south and north is quite ideal. However, since we will need to capture more western cities to capitulate the Soviets, we will send our cavalry to capture them. But our infantry could still advance a little, for example with the capturing of Stalingrad. Meanwhile at home we hadn't only trained 24 divisions with another 24 planned before we capitulate the Soviets, but we had also ramped up our production of aircrafts. Focusing on fighters, both light and heavy, since the German Air Force is actually a threat compared to the Soviet. Once those extra 24 divisions were deployed, we sent our cavalry to the last remaining cities needed to capitulate the Soviets. Despite the Red Army trying their best to recapture the cities we had already captured, they were too slow as we captured two cities at the same time as they liberated one. So eventually after the fall of both Leningrad and Kiev and four years after the start of the war, Stalin capitulated and Russia lies completely in our hands. The peace deal was extremely complicated, but from east to west we annexed all states bordering the Sea of Okhotsk and Bering Sea, Menjiang was expanded to all of Mongolia and Siberia was split into four different states. In Central Asia and the Caucasus even more nations were created and puppet leaders were put in place. Then in mainland Russia we also established a puppet regime but further split it up as the Tatars in Kazan who had helped us so much during the war were awarded their own state. Finland also got a bunch of land to stop them from joining the Germans and finally Poland got all the land needed to reform the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. However, they won't stay Polish for long as the Axis forces have already started marching east to meet our armies. Fortunately, our army has been quick to set up a defensive line that will hopefully stop the Germans. It starts in Crimea, then goes east to Stalingrad, where it turns north all the way to Volgoda. We will additionally try to hold Leningrad for as long as possible, but we don't expect to hold it indefinitely. We've also deployed our air force of 750 planes over Moscow, with more to come, to stop at least the bulk of the German air force. Back home we have done a lot of things, not only are we training 75,000 men, but we've also granted Manchukuo more liberty in order to strengthen a possible front against the Chinese. In addition, now that we stand together with the Allies against the Axis, we've managed to strike trade deals with them so that we can import the rubber we need for our planes at a much cheaper rate. Returning to the front, the first few Axis forces are arriving at our defenses and an air battle has also started over Moscow that we are so far winning. Once the true ground battles started, they looked like everything we had wished for. Tired and undersupplied the German forces trying and failing to break our wall. At one point outside of Tula they were somewhat close, however we could easily reinforce the small area with divisions around it, stopping all Axis advances right in their tracks. 
Our defense was even so successful we dared sending in some of our reserve forces to hold Rezev and deny the supply hub from the Germans. However, after this loss, the Germans would soon stop all their offensives, meaning it's our time to shine. Taking some forces from the north they hadn't reached yet, we assembled a small force to irritate the Germans as much as possible. The first skirmish was outside of Moscow, where we encircled four infantry and one panzer division. After this we would continue anywhere where the Germans had supply issues, such as outside of Stalingrad and outside of Rezen. All the while our air force, together with the British, continued to reduce the Luftwaffe. After one more, far bigger encirclement, we felt more than ready to begin the liberation of Poland. Because for quite a while we have prepared two secret weapons. One is six light tank divisions, who might be useful in encirclements, and the second is paratroopers, who are even more useful. And to try both of them out and start the liberation of Poland, we have the perfect operation planned. <laughs> After exposing the weak underbelly of the Germans, their allies, we have overstretched our front a little too much, especially as the Germans started reinforce the Balkans. However, despite this, we are holding back all their attacks and inflicting more damage on them in the process. And we will still try to continue attacking, but focus on making the front smaller this time. The best area to do this is in the north, where the Germans are least expecting an attack. And this showed as we could easily reach Poskov with our tank divisions and encircle a bunch of German troops. So with renewed hope for offensive action, we used our paratroopers and six more light tank divisions to try and encircle Novgorod. It was all surprisingly successful, except once we had to close it, where we had to land with our paratroopers and attack from two sides. And so a bunch more Axis forces were encircled and later crushed. These types of offensives would continue until we had liberated all of Latvia, parts of Lithuania and arrived to the Polish mainland. However, things were still difficult, so we decided to skip advancing in the center and simply going straight to Germany. This was a great idea, since Königsberg was quite weak, allowing us to continue all the way to Gdansk and Hinterpommern. However, this is where we turned south and using our paratroopers we liberated a bunch of Polish lands, which led to all railways for the Eastern Front being cut off for the Germans. This means we can fully focus on the West, since the East won't be able to fight. And this was a great call, because mainland Germany wasn't really protected. They had some troops, but other than that our light tanks could simply drive to Berlin and continue seizing all North German cities in a swooping offensive. Once we were certain that the Germans would capitulate if we paradropped all their southern cities, we did just that, landing in Bavaria and Austria, which was enough for Hitler to surrender and our pledge to Poland achieved. However, the war continues, not only in Europe against Italy and the Balkans, but also in Asia where the Chinese have declared war on us. Fortunately, both aren't big issues for us now that the Germans are defeated. Especially since we have brand new modern tank divisions never tested before. We started of course with clearing out Europe, since all our forces were there, and since we had no hurry at defeating the Chinese as they have already been contained. As Romania had already fallen, Hungary was the following nation to capitulate. Then together with the Allies, which are finally doing something, we caused a civil war in Italy which quickly led to the fall of Mussolini. 
And with that, the final resistance in the Balkans was doomed, which means only Spain remains in Europe to defeat. However, we will leave them for the Allies to deal with and instead turn to China. Since the Chinese armies only consist of infantry, this will probably be the easiest out of all our wars. Especially since we are so familiar with fighting in terrain that isn't well supplied. And it will be even easier considering we are on our way to set up a collaboration government in our country. The first offensive against them was conducted with all our tank force which drove along the coast, recapturing our occupied land and even arriving to Beijing as well as encircling all Chinese troops who had invaded our puppets. With the Chinese army now reduced to less than 150 divisions, which is almost less than our Qing ally, we have decided to instead focus on the two warlords that we are at war with. What's great is that they aren't allied with the Chinese, which will allow us to defeat them alone. And that we did, with Shangxi falling first and Shibei Sanma later capitulating after we para-dropped their capital. So only China is left and we've actually gotten help from the allies. Together with them, the Chinese army was swiftly defeated, with us not even having to capture Chongqing for Chiang Kai-shek to surrender. And now once he did, the war is finally over, a war that has spilled the blood of more than 35 million humans, which isn't even counting the Soviet war. We met together with the allied delegates in Nanjing to draw up the new borders of the world, and while it did take some time, we are happy to say that our interests have been achieved. In China, Emperor Puyi has taken all nationalist lands, including those occupied by the British, as we gave them Italy in return. And here in Europe, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth has finally been established, with our great allies' influence even spreading to Czechia, Hungary and Romania. Yugoslavia, another one of our allies whom we haven't talked about, got all their lands back and a puppet in Bulgaria. And lastly, we established puppet regimes in Germany and Austria. And so a new era for the world has started, one could say a cold war between our Tokyo Warsaw Pact and the Allies with support from the Americans. However, war isn't something we have to worry about, because we are on our way to construct our very first nuclear weapon. And this means that we instead can focus on building up the lands of our alliance and strengthen our relations. And the biggest project of them all is already being planned, the complete upgrade of the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way to Berlin. So thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.